Jake Roberts. And you talk about epic, and you talk about taglines, and you talk about just memories and moments, and you talk about changing the face of the business. All things happened 25 years ago today, Tommy. You know, Dave, I went back recently because I watched the Steve Austin uh, biography as well as the Jake the Snake uh, biography. I went back and I watched that match because I remember when it was happening and it wasn't <clears throat> the greatest in-ring match. And then, you know, the backstory of Steve getting uh, being in the hospital, literally walking back from the hospital to the ring to get stitched up. Because, again, and for those listening, doctors weren't at WWE shows, doctors weren't at indie shows, doctors weren't at any of these shows a lot of times. So that's where if you got hurt, you had to go to a hospital. Um, and then that match wasn't the greatest, but then that promo was one of the best. And even if you hear about his heart and his passion, it was just like, you know, off the cuff. And on the biography, he describes it about, and I'm sure he'll tell the story when he comes on, where he got that line. But just his deliverance, his cadence, and just like all the circumstances that led to just that passionate promo, unscripted, and just go out there and be you. And that's why I always say being you is the best version you'll ever be. Yeah, and I mean, seriously, Tommy, you, you've been in the wrestling business for so long, so many decades, so many matches, just like we talked about with Alex, with Chris Jericho. I mean, you talk about an iconic promo. You know, in that promo at King of the Ring 25 years ago, you got the, you know, the stone, you got the Austin 316, and then you got, and that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold said so. You got two, like, classics in one promo, and as you said, off the cuff, unscripted, you know, all he heard was from Michael Hayes that, you know, Jake the Snake Roberts, you know, cut a religious promo on him. Obviously, Jake was you know, was going through th some things at that time, was leaning on some things at that time. And and seriously, Tommy, to come up with two classics in one promo, I mean, that's unheard of, that are still talked about today. The T-shirts are still worn today. It's, it's unbelievable what he was able to do 25 years ago. Dude, he's, I mean, again, another guy on many, many Mount Rushmore's of professional wrestling, and his attitude, his swagger, uh, and his hard work made him really Steve Austin. I remember when he came to ECW and he was pissed off because he got fired from WCW while hurt, uh, unemployed. Think about if that happened today, <laughs> unable yeah. to earn a living, uh, you're let go from a company. And he never really had the great opportunity to talk. And Paul was just like, here, tell me. Tell a story. Do whatever is on your mind, go. And, you know, he debuted. He debuted the same day, I believe it was Bully Ray or Bubba Ray debuted in ECW in uh, Middletown, New York at, uh, I want to say, it's like, it was like an arcade, like fun station. And here's Steve Austin uh, there. And he just did a backstage with, um, Joey Styles and as a Hulk Hogan, and then he ripped yeah. it off, and you saw this new character. And then the next week, he was in Beulah's box because her box was always open for you, and did the Monday Nyquil scenario. And it was just this guy who, you know, kind of like a Johnny Gargano, where we just saw him as this very, very good wrestler, especially in a tag team or a, as a singles guy, and then he just became this entertaining figure. Then he goes to WWE, the ringmaster, all stuff that was just kind of not him. And by different circumstances, Triple H was supposed to win it, uh, the tournament. Triple H gets uh, his hand slapped for the whole yeah. click thing at Madison Square Garden, and he gets deep pushed, and then Steve Austin winds up in the spot. And that almost didn't happen, too. They were thinking of changing the finish because Steve had gotten hurt. But he knew... Back then, King of the Ring meant something. And then, boom, just look how, like, all those circumstances happened. And there you have it. Tommy, so much out of what you just said. Think about it. Like, you know, that was supposed to be Triple H. Triple H got, you know, got in trouble for the whole click 
scenario, right? You know, didn't get that opportunity. Man, how wrestling could have changed if it wasn't Stone Cold Steve Austin that was going to win King of the Ring. Think about that. You know, if it, think about, like, if there wasn't the issues and, you know, and, and Jake finding, finding the Lord and having that whole image going into King of the Ring. Stone Cold never would have given that promo that he gave, you know, just before the main event at, uh, just before the main event at King of the Ring in 1996. Like, you really yeah. look how pro wrestling, you know, it's just like sports, right, Tommy? If, boy, if that, if that wide receiver would have just caught that ball, if that tackle wasn't made, if the referee didn't make that call, how that could change the path of a team or a player's career, it's the same thing in pro wrestling. Uh, was it Mo Lewis's hit on Drew Bledsoe emerged yep. Tom Brady? Yep. And Drew Bledsoe was a very, very good quarterback and then but gets hurt you think of all these scenarios we've had a lot of what ifs that we've learned through busted open like with the awa with literally doing hogan versus andre which would have been on cbs television and greg Gagne telling us the backstage story where hulkamania and all this would have like taken off somewhere else uh if the fans didn't rocky sucks if you didn't see all these different transitions or all these different things happened, there's all these different circumstances. I watched the Mick Foley. Mick Foley still to this day, his favorite interviews was when he became anti-hardcore in ECW. And then Bruce Pritchard and Vince McMahon say, wait, this guy can talk. And he could show different characters of this Cactus Jack persona that we don't want. There's so many different things that go into... And that's why I love, and as I get older, I keep saying this, like people's stories, people's documentaries, um, or just how you got to where you are, because where you are today, because if you ever told Tommy Dreamer he'd be doing a radio show on a Wednesday, I'd be like, no, I'm not. I'd be wrestling every day. Uh, I had opportunities to, to do acting stuff. No, I'm a wrestler. I was so, so one-minded, but you think about how things change in your life, your priorities change. The fact that I have children, like I never wanted any of that. I just wanted wrestling, wrestling. And then you realize there's other things in life that are important. But there's other things that are in life, like when your career trajectory takes certain turns, they, they happen, like when they say everything happens for a reason, you think it's the lowest point of your life. And this is why I talk about when, when I spoke to Mickey James or, or when you spoke to people who are fired, it's okay because life will change. The guy got fired he, while he was hurt, could not make a living. And then here came the slow emergence of, you know, the Steve Austin character. And then all these little circumstances, the business would have been totally different if things like that didn't happen. Think, think of the, the Undertaker when he was mean Mark Calloway, walking the top rope and dropping this amazing elbow as his finish. And then someone says, well, we want to make you a dead person. Oh, man, that'll never get over. But he took that opportunity, but plus, because he was such a great talent, like, he went with it. And think of, like, the great career we've had The Undertaker, uh, or the, you know, even the Chris Jericho getting fired from WCW. And then guess what? That debut that he had in WWE is one of the greatest debuts of all time. And think of the career he's had, where he was another guy who was told, you're too small, you're too this. He was nothing but cruiserweight Chris Jericho if he would have stayed the WCW route. So many different things happen. Uh, you know, he becomes the first undisputed champion. Why? Because he was the best frigging guy in the ring. Yeah. It's I'm unbelievable. Excited. I'm excited because now I got to go back into my record books because of Chris Jericho and Alex Marvez's. And for some reason, I did not write down April 13th, 2009, when Chris Jericho defeated me in four minutes or five now minutes. Now I got to go and help you with the research so we can put out, you know, 30 years of Tommy Dreamer. That should be coming out soon. But you're right about incidents that changed history. Nia Jax punched to the face of Becky Lynch. Now, would we have gotten that main event at WrestleMania 35 if Nia Jax doesn't punch, you know, Becky Lynch in the nose and bust up her nose? Uh, Daniel Bryan losing to Sheamus in 18 seconds at WrestleMania 28. Everybody was so angry 
that Daniel Bryan lost to Sheamus in 18 seconds. It started the Yes movement. And two years after that incident, you know, he's holding two titles in the, in the middle of the ring with confetti coming down as one of the greatest WrestleMania moments of all time. So like you said, what you think could be the darkest moment of career could be the start of the biggest moment of your career that changes history, Tommy. That instance is different because of like, you know, we were talking with Alex uh, before social media. Fans have such an uproar about certain stuff. Hey, look at look at what just happened to Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe was let go by the WWE. Yep. Samoa Joe was then rehired by the I don't think Samoa Joe was unemployed. I'm sure he was, he was still getting his checks, but literally found, and now he has a whole new life. And it's just everything like that, like I said, happens for whatever reasons, whatever cosmic uh, things happen in the universe. It is what it is. Uh, I also look at like the emergence of, from the other end, Deanna Perrazzo. Yep. Deanna Perrazzo has been killing it as the NXT, um, not the NXT, the Impact Women's World Champion. She was let go by NXT. She was deemed not good enough. Yet, she's been killing it, and now everyone's talking about having dream matches with her. Uh, it, it's just, listen, man, uh, I saw recently Britt Baker, uh, when she had her tryout, WWE posted her tryout match uh, when the same day, ironically, when she won the AEW title uh, and she lost to somebody, but they put that out there and it's just like, cool, you didn't see anything in her. And guess what? She's now the face of a somebody else's company. Yep. That's the beauty of the beauty of a Tony Khan, the beauty of an impact wrestling, the beauty of a new Japan pro wrestling it gives other people options. When Austin did it, there really was not a whole lot of options for the guy. And, you know, he just took off and think of all the friggin' moments that Steve Austin has given us. Also think about like, honestly, to this day, is there name somebody who hits the ropes harder than Steve Austin did go back and watch any Steve Austin. I would say Steve Austin, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, Owen Hart hit the, but I think Steve Austin just hit him the hardest out of anybody. And that's uh, work ethic. You know what, though, Tommy, like so many, you know, matches, promos, incidents that changed the course of pro wrestling and made pro wrestling history. I want to hear from the Busted Open Nation. Let's talk about some of those moments. Let's talk about some of those matches. Let's talk about some of those promos. Let's talk about some of those incidents. Give us a call. It's our next guest, and that is the legendary Stone Cold Steve Austin. Sir, how are you this morning? Man, would you guys blast that scorpions every time I come on? I love it. So appreciate the music selection. I'm down with it. <laughs> down 20... like four flats. <laughs> 25 years ago, Stone Cold, King of the Ring, 1996. Tommy and I have been talking about it. You know, obviously the promo that everyone remembers changed the course, I think, in of the history of pro wrestling. It's still talked about today. People still wear T-shirts you know, when it comes to that today, you can't go to an arena anywhere in the world where somebody's not wearing an Austin 316 shirt. I mean, history 25 years ago on this date. You know, who would have figured it would last that long? <clears throat> and, you know, I, was, I watched that promo about 10 times last night just so I could, you know, kind of take myself back to where I was. But so many things <laughs> that had to happen, and I'll, I'll just run through it real quick, for, for that promo to even happen. You know, the incident ha had to happen at the garden where the guys hugged because Triple H was supposed to win that King of the Ring. Vince tells me I'm going to win. Okay, so then I go in and wrestle Mark Merrill, who's a wonderful human being. I get along really good with him. I was fortunate enough that he kicked me in the mouth. If he had never kicked me in the mouth, this would have never happened. They haul me to the hospital. I get 14 stitches, come back. Michael PSA is right there at the ambulance to tell me, hey, Jake just cut a religious promo on you. So thank you, Jake, for cutting a religious promo. Thank you to Michael PSA for telling me that. Uh, so we didn't go out there and try to plan a barn burner of a match, myself and Jake. It was short to the point. Got rid of him, got the win. And, uh, you know, then Michael interviewed me and, you know, he told me, hey, man, we're, you know, when Jake was cutting his promo on you, it was kind of religious based. I said, well, what did he say? 
And he told me, and that's when the Austin 316 popped into my brain. And I went out there and, uh, you know, I had Austin 316. I had, uh, <clears throat> because Stone Cold said so, as a, as a button, because I knew I needed a button. I came up with that on the fly. And then looking back at that promo, you know, I predicted my future. I said, I don't care about any of the WWE superstars, what they are. They're all on the list. That's Stone Cold's list. And I'm fixing to start running through all of them. You always know you get a push coming out of, uh, out of King of the Ring. So I was predicting my push. And then also I threw myself into the title mix, which is what all these UFC fighters do these days. You know, they, they wanted me to say something about the championship match to dictate, you know, to let, you know, how important that match is. And I said, hey, I don't care if it's David Boy Smith or Sean, Sean Michaels, but you're looking at the next WWF champ if I ever get the shot. And that's the bottom line because I said so. So, so many things happened in that promo, but so many events happened to line up. It was almost like it was predestined for that promo to happen. And if none of those events would have happened or anything out of order, that promo would have never happened. Maybe I'd have still been a big star, but that promo gave me two taglines, 316, and because Stone Cold said so at one night at an event I was never supposed to win. So entirely grateful for all the pieces and people that fell in place for this thing to happen. And Steve, uh, back then, uh, you know, watching your latest documentary, before there was social media, you can see your internet buzz before the internet because of all those signs, all those 316 signs, where you now know you're on to something. Oh, definitely. We saw those signs. I remember, uh, you know, Mark just coming to the company. They brought in Vader, Mick Foley, a lot of guys, and they didn't really have any merchandising plans for me, and I'd always talk to Jimmy Miranda. You know, I said, God dang, Jimmy, they office got any ideas for a shirt for me? And he'd always say, nope, Stephen, they don't. Finally, when all those 316 signs started showing up, Tommy, I mean, it was a thing. And Jimmy comes up to me at TV one day, and he goes, Stephen, the office finally wants to do a shirt for you. You got any ideas? And I said, you got dang right I do. I said, put Austin 316 on the front, carbon, uh, stone cold on a skull on the back. And uh, we got it cleared. Uh, here's something I've said before, not, maybe not everybody knows, but Undertaker had to give me clearance to use that skull because Vince thought that might be gimmick infringement. I ran it by Mark. He was cool enough to give me the green light on the skull. Thank you, Mark. And that shirt was born. So, yeah, man, to your point, social media wasn't a thing. And you, when you go out there and you, you know how, how wild it was back then, those, those poster boards, those people spent so much time working were a definite indicator of, hey, man, we got something and it's turning, it's, it's catching on fire. Steve, a lot of people don't realize how much impact you had on doing your shirts and doing your merch. Like, did, did you just have the knack for that or did you have to kind of lobby to get that kind of power to be able to say, hey, let me, let me come up with these ideas? You know, when, when we, you know, when I said, hey, there, here's the first shirt and we came out with it, uh, <laughs> I had a little conversation with Vince because I remember getting a royalty check and I was like, look at that royalty check. And I was looking at all those shirts out there. And I was like, hey, man, this ain't match it up. And so I went to Vince and had a conversation with him and, you know, I increased my percentage. And uh, that's, a, that's a rare thing. And so at, at that point, you know, I kind of, you know, worked hand in hand with the art department and I'd kick them ideas and they'd shoot me a rendering. And I'd say, no, no, it's like this. So yeah, I just took it upon myself. And because you, it, was, it was a lot easier probably for talent to be hands-on with merch back in the day. But, you know, I, I, I saw the value in that shirt and I didn't think the percentages added up. And that was a key business move. I never liked talking contracts, money, you know, with bands and stuff like that. But that was, you know, something that I needed to address. I'm, I'm glad I did because, you know, I increased my, you know, my merch. Well, you just talked about ideas and obviously we're talking about the Austin 316 promo. And you said that you heard that Jake had cut a religious promo on you. So you came up with that off the top of your head and you had, like you said, two winners in one promo but you had the freedom to be able to do that. Like, I, like that, it, it pains me as a wrestling fan to know that how difficult that would happen today because of the scripted promos that are being used in pro wrestling. And you don't have that creative freedom that you had 25 years ago on the mic. You know, I, I, I'm not around today's current system. I, I thought someone got let go because they went off the script here recently. 
Uh, and maybe they're going to get let go anyway. I don't know. But, you know, it, it was a different time. It was still the wild, wild west back then. And here's the thing. I think even if you went off script in today's day and age, if you go out there and you hit a double grand slam walk off game, you know, series winning promo, I, I think everybody's going to be happy about it. You know, that that promo, you know, at the time, if you if you watch that promo, you know, I, I was on the way to getting over. I wasn't over over yet. And when I said Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass that and I love that Milwaukee uh, Becca arena. But that crowd, that was the biggest pop I got was from saying that one line. Uh, so I think, it, David, if you can, if you knock one out of the park and everybody knows it, I think you're cool. But if you just go out there and do something that's kind of good, mm. maybe you're showing up some potential. But, you know, it, it is a different system. And I don't know, you know, how tight they make the talent stick to that. But, hey, I'm just lucky that I came around when I did, and I was never afraid to push the envelope or go out on a limb. Once I started evolving into that Stone Cold Steve Austin character, man, I, I knew that I wasn't the biggest guy on the roster, you know, the, the most talented guy on the roster, the best looking, nothing. But I knew I had enough things that, it, that if, 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 you know, if I did everything that I could and executed at a high level, I could get over. And, you know, I remember Jack Lanza, uh, George Animal Steel, Sarge, uh, Jerry Briscoe, all those guys used to tell me, they said, Steve, it's going to take you longer to get over because you're not really a gimmick. This is kind of ringmaster days. And then I came up with Stone Cold thing. And they said, but once you get over, you're going to stay over because of what you're doing. And those guys are predicting the future. And they saw that in me. And I didn't see it in myself. But to their point, they were right. Well, we talked we talk to Stone Cold Steve Austin, the wrestler. We talked to Stone Cold Steve Austin, the man. Let's talk to Stone Cold Steve Austin, the artist. Because I remember a time when every pay-per-view came out, there was a different Stone Cold Steve Austin shirt. They had the, 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 the one with the snakes as the arms and, uh, you know, different ones. What made you think of that stuff? Well, you know, thankfully, Jim Ross, you know, my great friend Jim Ross was calling a lot of this stuff along with Jerry Lawler. But Jim Ross was instrumental in the career of Stone Cold Steve Austin, the way he endorsed me backhandedly because I wasn't a traditional white meat baby face. It was, it was a gray area type thing. And he started calling me the Texas rattlesnake. And, you know, I used to always hold my arms up like that when I went to the ring, but I couldn't straighten one arm out because it's crooked forever but i i just figured based on that pose mark based on that pose i said hey man it'd be pretty cool if some artist turned my arms into rattlesnakes because that was the name the nickname that jim ross had given me and they hired this badass you know acclaimed artist to come up with that shirt and that's where the artwork came from my idea but a great artist pulled it off and that was one of my favorite shirts of all time yeah. Steve, I use you a lot as an example based because of your hard work and your perseverance to younger talent and or when talent gets hurt. And I look when Steve Austin even became a bigger star was when he got hurt and or look at how this guy hit the ropes. Look at how this guy did his promos. And I, I talk about you to so many people because you are the biggest star and, and everybody has you on this Mount Rushmore. I got to ask you. Who's on your Mount Rushmore of pro wrestlers? So you can only pick four. You can put yourself. I, I won't. I, I never build one, Tommy. I never. I, I never build one. But but I, I'll build half of one because in, in my mind, you've got to have Major Boy Ric Flair and you have to have Hulk Hogan. And I leave the rest for anybody to do. And you know, I know you have you know Bruno San Martino from that era. But my two guys that I will always go to are Hogan and Flair, and I leave the rest up to anybody else. All right. I'm not going to put myself on there because I don't want to make a ball of smoke. I had a good run. Someone's got me on there. That's cool. But my two guys are Hogan and Flair. Is there a dream match you never got to have that you really wanted? Yeah, it would have been great, you know, to, to go against Hogan. You know, like he was still, you know, pretty primed up. He was on the backside, but still, you know, could do it. Uh, my my headspace wasn't in the right place, but certainly I could have done it. It'd been a different match than he ever had. Uh, but yeah, Hogan, 
uh, Flair, I wish I could work with Flair in his prime. I worked with him the night before I walked out in Atlanta over doing the favors for uh, Brock Lesnar. And we worked in a cage that night, and I was happy as a kid in a candy store. And Flair had his blades all over his fingers. It was like working with Ed- Eddie Scissorhands. And I, 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 they, he, 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 he gaffed me so many times. I remember that. And I, was, I was in heaven because I was working with Nature Boy, and it was like working with Eddie Scissorhands. So Flair is prime. I mean, I, I could go, I can, I can name almost, you know, anybody that you guys look up to as well as I do, but those two right off the bat. And for anybody who listens to this show, and Tommy and Mark know this, you know, the Nature Boy Ric Flair is my, my favorite. I think he's the greatest of all time. But I tell, I tell a lot of fans here, they don't understand it. If when if I went to the Meadowlands and Hogan was on the card, it would be sold out, 23,000 fans. If he wasn't on the card, you had five, 6,000 fans. Like, that's the difference between Hogan being on the show and Hogan not being on the show back then. Well, man, you know, the guy's drum power is unheard of, and he did it for so long at a high level. But, you know, and, he, and Hogan was a great worker in his own right. Mm-hmm. and just had such an ear and such a feel for the people about how to draw them in. When it comes time to ringing that bell, though, the greatest world champion and my favorite of all time is nature boy Ric Flair. I thought he represented the world championship title across the world better than anybody ever has. Shawn Michaels, when you ring a bell to when you ring the bell in the match, is the best performer. As far as the reality of wrestling, who made it really seem like the truest sport in the world, Brett the Hitman Hart. It's funny you talk about that match. I talk about what great psychology. And on the biggest stage of them all, a double turn results because of that match. I mean, you bleeding, uh, passing out in the sharpshooter. We always, you know, wrestling fans want to talk about winners and losers but somebody went over but somebody got over to the point of friggin stone cold steve austin i mean the blood. what oh, what a night it's amazing yeah. and you man and that's you know first of all it's almost never booked like that because i mean double turns are, are damn near impossible the fact that you know brett said hey man you need color so we, we you know we got color and it was taboo back then, but Brett took me under his insurance policy because he'd been there longer. He had the stroke. And again, well, that's something that you could have really gotten in trouble for, but because it got over at such a high level and that crowd was just, you know, everybody was mesmerized by that match. Uh, you know, we, we didn't catch any flack for that. And I actually busted my head open on a guardrail for the record. But, you know, <laughs> Bret Hart, Bret Hart had, a, had a great mind for the business. And you... That was one of those, you know, luckily we were in Chicago as well. I got to give a lot of credit to that crowd because Chicago became a stronghold for me. And I'll never forget working a tag match there. It was just at a house show. We were working a tag. And every time I got in, those people started responding to me. And I was like, hey, man, this is Stone Cold, early, early days. And I said, hey, man, these people are really starting to buy into this character and had that I think we'd have rocked the house anywhere we went out to, any, any place we would have went out to. But for some reason, Chicago has always been a great building for me. That Rosemont Horizon with the wood ceiling, great acoustics, and the feel for that crowd because they love their wrestling. And it was a hot angle. Brett's a working son of a gun. And uh, we just have great chemistry. And we were able to pull that off. And it's, and to your point, man, it doesn't happen every day. And if you tell someone to go out there and try it, man, good luck. Because you, you're going to need every bit of skill and, uh, you know, the way you work that crowd to, to pull that off. I, Steve, uh, I just looked at Dave and Tommy, and I think I I have the the podcast. We do something called Master's Class, and, and it airs on Sundays here on Busted Open. Uh, the arena that made you perform the best and I, I i have three and i want to hear your three my three is dallas any any state any stadium any arena in dallas the crowd is crazy my second one is philadelphia because they were always anti they force you to work different than you ever worked and if you couldn't conform to what they wanted they shit on everything that was holy to you. 
And as much as I would like to say Madison Square Garden, it's the same as you. It's the Rosemont. That wood ceiling, me and The Undertaker, WrestleMania 22, me and Daniel Bryan, I, I had like three matches that I could think of in my life and uh, even getting my ass whooped by Brock Lesnar there. Like, it was, man, I took four or fives. Three of them were on the floor. So to be able to get up from that, I was just feeling it. What arenas, uh, three arenas that, that did that to you? Chicago, Rosemont, uh, Madison Square Garden, because it was a garden. I mean, those people are, you know, it's very similar to a Philly crowd in a way, but the building is special because it's the garden. But they've seen it all. They've heard it all. I mean, so it's a tough crowd. If you can get over in front of that garden crowd, you can get over anywhere. I'm glad that you brought that Philly crowd up because, I mean, boy, that, that could be a challenge. You know, you know Medellin's could be a challenge as well, but Nassau Coliseum, holy Cow, if you're a baby oh, face yeah. making a comeback, don't come back to Nassau Coliseum, <laughs> but to round out my top three, because they're, they're <laughs> shit all over you. I'm going to go Houston Summit. Now, they don't work there anymore. They got a new bill. Oh, Joe Osteen man. Is out there, but I'm going Houston Summit, Mark. Okay, Steve. All right. Uh, I'm going to go back and find the day, but I think we should also have another day for you. Because in the business, we call a road warrior pop, but we should be renamed. I'm going to petition Jack Tunney for a Steve Austin pop because I have never heard or experienced a louder pop in my career when the Alliance is kicking everybody in WWE's ass and your music hit and that glass breaking and the ring. And when I'm telling you, it started shaking. And I was like, you know, I'm coming from ECW and I'm like, oh my God, it felt like an earthquake. Um, yeah. So that day should be, and we should change forever. It's called the Steve Austin pop. Is there any pop that in your career where you were just like, my God, this is the loudest thing I've ever heard? Man, that was a good one. When we went to Toronto, we, we started off live and I came out there and I, I think we were sold out. I think that place held about 43,000 at the Sky Dome. Man, that was, that was one of those long-lasting pops. Like Mark, you've talked about that Undertaker pop. You know, it just it just won't stop. And Lawler was talking over. He goes, he he couldn't believe it either. But the one you're talking about, uh, the one when I ran out and helped Mick Foley win the World Championship against The Rock, because the man, they just had a great beatdown going up there, out there. And you know, a lot of everything that goes into those pops, Tommy is. Yeah, I was super over, but when you really set the stage. For someone who's super over, I mean, it magnifies everything, right? So I got to thank thank uh, Booking and Bench for putting me in a lot of great positions to get those pops. But th th those, out of respect for the Road Warriors, and, 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 and I got to agree with you because I think that some of my pops, you know, you, you can call it the Stone Cold, the Austin pop, whatever. But out of respect for the for the Road Warriors, God rest both of their souls. You know, I'm cool with, with just keeping it the Road Warrior pop because Come on. they they did they, they were the they they would you know the originators. Pop, but they're the originators, so I am so cool with it still being a Road Warrior pop. No, knowing what I know, but if people want to change it, that's fine. But I, I'm a huge I was a huge Road Warrior fan. Me too. Steve, I'm just trying listen. to give you another day to celebrate your. Oh, your another event. day, Steve. We trying. <laughs> listen, we're trying to gift you on Busted Open. We can't just take from you. We're, we're the number one show something. on Sirius. We got a big pull here. We could make this happen. Oh, but okay, we got, but you we got, got a understand. stroke over here. <laughs> I can't just just jump in and say, you know what, Tommy, you're right. Forevermore, it's the Austin Pop. Because then I look like an asshole. All right, I'll look like the <laughs> asshole. But I get no, people over. Think, that's what I do. But, but I appreciate Steve, you you noting that. Steve, we always got to take stuff back to food here. I'm gonna tell you something. <laughs> the reason that the reason that Vince put you in those positions is not because uh, he just was doing that because out of the goodness of his heart, he saw not only the sizzle but he saw the steak too. You have them both, brother. Like, you're going to take your flowers while you're alive. You and Dave LaGreca, what in the world are we going to have to do, Tommy, to get either one of these men standing on this, to the left of us, to take a compliment? <laughs> this, what are we going to have to do? Steve, you got the sizzle and the steak. <laughs> Come on, man, yeah, take I, that love. But you know, okay, I'm taking the love, but you, you know right. how it is. You know, when, when, when I, you're I climbing do, up the ranks, 
when you're climbing up the ranks, man, and you ain't got a pot to piss in, and you're working with, with journeyman guys that have been in the business 10 or 15 years, and they're all making a little bit more than you, and you're making 15 or $20 a night. And those guys are taking you under their wing, and they're dropping learnings on you, and you're traveling down the road asking them, asking them questions, and you realize that, hey, man, if I do not learn how to manipulate and work these people, I cannot increase how much money I'm making. So, you know, it, it, it's it's something that, you know, it, you really have to pay your dues to learn that aspect of it. I mean, you, you truly do, and it's like watching Ricky Morton out there, and, you know, they would say chicks in the front row. They'd use a different word, chicks in the front row crying because Ricky's selling. And you watch guys like that, and so you, you never believe your own bullshit. You, and you stay humble uh, because it can all disappear and you live and die by that crowd response. So I never take that for granted, but I'm always appreciative of it. But it took a long time to to really master that and, and, and make that work. Uh, you know, for everybody just, listening, Steve Austin, uh, I, I'm proud to call you friend. I'm proud to share a locker room with you. For everybody listening, he was the same guy from ECW to when he was the world champion, he was always talking, helping, trying to do other things for other talent. Uh, not a lot of champions can say the same thing, but uh, from for me, I've always had nothing but respect for you because you've always been and truly be one of the boys. And from Tommy Dreamer, Funaki to Rock, Austin, you, you pay everybody the same respect, man. You're awesome. Thank you, Tommy. I appreciate it. And, and we only have 90 seconds here, but Mark mentioned before about the wrestler, the man, the artist, but as a host, you know, and I, and I, and I've reached out to you before and I was like, I was texting you and I was like, I'm texting, texting Stone Cold Steve Austin. He doesn't give a shit what I have to say, but it's like, you know what? I've been in the radio business for over 20 years. Maybe there is a little bit of stroke here, but you have done a phenomenal job on Broken Skull Sessions. You are one of the best interviewers that I have ever seen or heard. Like the way that you can start a conversation and get people talking, it, it's second to none. And I have to really give you that compliment because you're doing a phenomenal job. Make you cry man, like I, Oprah. <laughs> man, I appreciate it. You know, you, it's kind of like a batting average. You know, if you're batting average, uh, you know, in the major leagues is 350, that's pretty damn good. But, you know, you, if your batting average is 350 on your interview show, you ain't doing very good. So I, I'm not hitting a grand slam on all of them, but I'm trying like hell to do the best that I can. Half the time, I still don't know what I'm doing, but I just try. I just want the boys to relax and have a good time. So I'm doing. I'm, I'm doing my best, and they really have surrounded me with an outstanding crew. When that, when those guys come out here, we have a really good time filming those things. But I have a great support crew for that show. So thank you very much. Yeah, and and honestly, thank you so much for the time. Thank you so much for everything. Can't believe it was 25 years ago today that we got King of the Ring 1996. You know, to me, you know, the greatest promo, when you look at how it really changed the landscape and how we look at pro wrestling right now and how it really changed the, the landscape of the WWF at that time. Uh, so, Stone Cold, thank you so much.